Hello, AP Euro. It's Mr. Walker, and um, this is a, a video I'm making to, if you need it, to help you with the DBQ, the partial DBQ I'm giving you on the quiz, um, AP quiz number two, uh, that is about Elizabeth I and gender. And so this is a, uh, a DBQ from, I think it was 2001 or two or three. Um, and I amended it, so I changed it so that it's only five documents, so it's going to look like uh, an AP exam question that you would get on this year's exam. And I also changed the prompt to reflect perhaps what might be on um, an exam this year. Of course, we don't know what the prompt and the topic of this year's exam is going to be. It's anything between 1450 and um, 1914, so anything and everything in between. But um, I'm going to go through this with you, and and hopefully uh, this helps as you're taking this quiz and uh, as you think about it in a way that um, that's helpful. Okay, so here we go. Uh, and if you look at the, the prompt that I wrote, it says, Analyze the extent to which Elizabeth I continued or challenged traditional gender roles in England during her reign from 1558 to 1603. So that's the prompt. All right. The first question, and then there are five documents. One, two, three, four. One is a, an image, so you'll likely get one document that's an image, or it could be a graph, actually. So, uh, But most likely it'll be an image. And uh, the final fifth document is also is a, is text. And so the first thing I ask you in your quiz, at first I ask you questions on this quiz that have to do with uh, when the AP exam is and then do you have space that you'll be able to be uninterrupted for 90 minutes? Are you going to have a computer? Uh, have you spoken to your family about making sure you're supported during the time? Um, also about cheating the fact that it's an open book test. So you can use your book and use your notes, but you can't um, look online for answers or communicate with other people. And uh, in that I'm going to get the test back also, and it'll count for my class as well. And if you, you know, uh, cheat on the exam, you'll actually might have to forfeit taking future AP exams. You'll also uh, fail my class. And so uh, what I want you to do is just make sure I much rather want you to try as hard as you can and fail spectacularly. Um, that's a great learning experience versus try to um, try to cheat or find ways uh, around it. Uh, and so... Just do do your very best, and that's all um, you can ask of yourself. And in these weeks that we we're practicing, um, hopefully this will this will end up helping you. Um, so, the first question I have about this uh, this DBQ is write a historic context about two or three sentences. What would the historic context for this time be? Well, take a look at the prompt, and if there is are specific dates. This is great. Um, also look for the place. So we're talking about England between 1558 and 1603. And so the, for the historic context, historic context, I'm thinking about the major chapters that we studied during um, this period, 1558 uh, to 1603. Think about what period, what wall of the classroom was this on? Well, it's going to be sometime between 1450 and 1648. That's that period one time, right? When this these dates of the thesis fall in between. And so what's going on during this time? What are the major chapters of study? You can say between 1558 and 1603. This is during the time of, what's that first chapter? The Renaissance, which was going on from, you know, the 1400 to 1600. And in England... Uh, there is a renaissance happening during the time of Queen Elizabeth with Shakespeare. Also, what is the other major chapter that we studied during this time? The Reformation. And the Reformation, you know, roughly that breaking point in 1517 with Martin Luther. And in England, you can write that King Henry VIII uh, started the Reformation breaking with the Catholic Church. Um started Anglican Church. And also the final chapter that's during this time is has to do with global exploration. 
And even though we've got Spain as a leader in global exploration, Spain is the leader in uh, colonies. You also have England. And why am I talking about England? Because this, um, this prompt is about England. England has, um, has colonies in, has colonial, I was going to write colonies, but I wrote colonial by accident has colonies in North America. And remember, you can think back to Queen Elizabeth. She's known as the Virgin Queen. They, uh, Virginia is during the time of, of Queen Elizabeth, uh, named after her. Okay, um, so that's a basic historic context. If you can put these major ideas um, into, let's say, two or three sentences, this is how you're going to start your DBQ with a historic context. Um, the next thing you're going to write in your first paragraph, so this is all in your paragraph one, right? You start off with um, a historic context, giving the general overview, and then you come up with a thesis. And the way I want you to write your thesis to start your paper is a simple thesis. It doesn't have to be a complex thesis yet because, of course, you haven't read all the documents yet. Um, and, uh, and so just give yourself a, um, a moment of time to breathe and make a marker for a thesis, something that answers the prompt and gives you a um, uh, gives an answer. But you know that at the very end of your paper, before the time is up, you're going to write a complex thesis at the end. But first, I want you to basically um, come up with a, a basic placeholder thesis, a simple thesis. And so this says, analyze the extent to which. This is a, a big part and then continued or challenged traditional gender roles. When we look at a question that says, analyze the extent to which, we're gonna say, does she, um, this is on a continuum where you answer, did she um, continue traditional gender roles or challenge them? Did she, and so this is also a continuity and change, continue or challenge gender. And so, the extent to which is going to be, did she completely continue gender roles? Uh, and that if she completely continued gender roles, that means she would have no challenge to gender roles. Or did she partially continue gender roles and moderately or partially continue gender roles while um, moderately challenging gender roles? Um, did she... Uh, extremely continue or not challenge. And so basically when you're doing a, a analyze the extent to which you're going to say, was it barely? Was it moderately? Was it um, partially? Was it extremely? These are all ways of, uh, of giving, of making a claim that has to uh, do with the extent to which someone, um, to which Queen Elizabeth uh, acted. And so did she moderately continue or extremely challenge gender roles? Did she partially continue and partially challenge gender roles? And so you'll make a claim. And then in a simple thesis, you have to write a because, all right? You have to give reasoning. So you make a claim that answers this, analyzing the extent to which she continued traditional gender roles or challenged them. And then you'll have to give a, a, a why, a reasoning. And it can be simple reasoning. Uh, you could, she, um, and you have to figure out uh, some kind of reasoning for that. And so gender roles because, uh, and, and so you have to give some kind of reasoning. I'm not going to tell you the reasoning because I want you to to try to figure that out. Um, and so this is basically your thesis. It can be one or two sentences. You'll give a claim of how much she continued the traditional gender roles of women and how much she challenged and then give a why, an answer, okay? Um, all right, so you're gonna have a historic context and a thesis that uh, answers the question, which gives a claim and also reasoning. Okay, um, let's see. So historic. Now one document by 
This next question says, introduce one document by attributing the source. What is the name and nationality of the speaker and whom are they speaking? And so, for example, Elizabeth, Queen of England, was addressing Parliament when she argued blank. Instead of writing in document three, it says. So we don't. And so attributing means when you're introducing a document, don't just say document two says or document three says. Instead, write, look at the source, say Elizabeth, the Queen of England, argued to Parliament that blah, blah, blah. And then describe the contents of that document. Do not quote directly from the document. And so, um, so here, let's, if we just look at document one, I'm gonna have to introduce it and then describe it. Okay. And so here, I wouldn't say in document one, I would say the source is the parliament of England act of supremacy, 1559. And so this is, um, so the Parliament of England, or the English Parliament, the English Parliament in a, an act, in an act in 1559. And so an act, this is an official document. And so stated and now i can't quote directly i'm going to have to use my own words but here i've attributing it and saying the english parliament in an act in 5059 stated um what's it going to say all right so first i'm going to read the text the queen's highness is the only supreme governor of this realm and all and of all other her highness's dominions and countries as well as in as well in all spiritual or ecclesiastical things or causes as temporal, and no foreign prince, person, prelate, state, or potentate hath or ought to have jurisdiction, power, superiority, preeminence, or authority, ecclesiastical or spiritual, within this realm. And there's an asterisk here. The Queen's Highness is the only supreme governor. What is supreme governor? The first act of supremacy in 1534 declared Henry VIII supreme head of the Church of England. And so here, what is Parliament saying about Elizabeth? Is she, um, she is the only supreme governor of this realm and of all other Her Highness's dominions and countries. So what is this saying? Parliament is saying that Elizabeth is the only head of the Church of England. Um, instead of being called supreme head, She's being called Supreme Governor. But this is saying it's the pretty much the same thing. And remember when we talk about monarchs, uh, they don't need consent from anyone else. She is the head of the church and no foreign prince, anyone else, anyone else is going to have power over her power to the church. And so the English Parliament in an act in 1559 stated that Elizabeth... was the, uh, I don't know, was the, was in charge of the church, in charge of the English church, and named her, and I'm just going to put this in quotes, Supreme Governor. All right, so I did put a quote, oh, and I want to um, cite my source. So before I put that period, ah, I'm going to put parentheses. I'm going to write doc one. So the English Parliament in an act in 1559, I'm introducing it. And then I saying what, what they said in that, stated that Elizabeth was in charge of the English church and named her Supreme Governor, document one. Okay, so here I've described it. If you can describe two documents like this, you get a point. If you can describe four documents like this, you get two points. You also get one point for historic context and one point for a thesis. So one, one, and again for a thesis. And um, once you describe two documents, you get another point. Okay. Um, and then 
for the document above, connect it to your thesis. How does it relate to your argument or claim? So in this document, how does this relate to our thesis? If she's in charge of the English church and named supreme governor, does this mean we go back to our, um, our argument, the extent to which she continues or challenges traditional gender roles in England? So here she is, I would say here, she's challenging gender roles because she is a woman who is being put in charge of the church and the act of parliament is putting in charge of the church. So I would say um, she's, um, um, she's uh, extremely challenging, ex extremely challenging the gender roles because she's being put in charge because she's the first woman uh, being put in charge of the church. Um, she is extremely challenging gender roles in England because she is the first woman to have power over the church. And so here, my first sentence describes it. My second sentence connects it to my argument, connects it to my thesis. And in my mind, as I'm just connecting it here, I'm thinking, oh, this means she's you know, severely or extremely challenging gender roles and that she's not going along with traditional gender roles. Okay. Um, next major question is answer using one of the following ways to provide complex analysis. Can I connect this argument to another time in history before or after or another geographic area? Or does one of the documents also support the argument? Or you know what, let me take this one at a time. Can I connect the argument to another time in history before or after or another geographic area? Okay, so for here, um, first woman to have power in the church, I could talk about here, I could make a more complex argument that in the Catholic Church, only men were allowed to be priests. And so this is very different from Catholic countries. I could write that there. Um, that would have to do with uh, another geographic area and other Catholic countries. Uh, another time or place. Um, let's see. Yeah, I guess I would say that the other uh, place I'd say in Catholic countries such as uh, in France or in Spain, um, women were not allowed um, we're not considered to have control over the church. Okay. Um, does one of the other documents support this agreement or undermine or modify the argument? So this is like, I'd look at another, um, like the second document and I'd see if it's related to this in any way, or if it takes away from the argument, undermines it or modifies it. And so this says that basically we argue that this, demonstrates that she has extreme authority. This one, however, that women have a changed role. Let's look at this one. This is the second book of homilies produced by the bishops of the Church of England, authorized by Elizabeth I in 1562. And so this says, so it's a official book by the English church that's giving direction to the people in England. The husband ought to be the leader and author of love and cherishing and increasing concord. But as for wives, they must obey their husbands and cease from commanding and perform subjection. For this surely doth nourish concord very much when the wife is ready at hand at her husband's commandment. Interesting. So are women given, uh, what is this saying? This is saying that in a household, the church is saying that um, women are subordinate to men, that men have power over women. And so even though they're making the woman the head of a church, uh, the gender roles of England are still very much patriarchal. Men still have control over women. And so this can modify our argument. And so um, first woman to have power over the church, however, um, most women 
in England still were forced to be obedient to their husbands. Um, as was, um, as is in this book of homilies, as was ordered by, um, the church in the book of homilies. And that's in document two. So the English parliament in Acts blah, 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 blah. She's the first woman to have power in the church. This is extremely challenging gender roles. And then he could write, uh, you know, this is unique. However, most women in England still were forced to be obedient to their husbands as was ordered by the church in the book of homilies. Um, and what's something that we can connect this to? Does Elizabeth get married? No, remember, she's known as the virgin queen. And so this is where um, we could take some outside evidence and put it in. Um, so outside evidence, we could write, Elizabeth never married. If you remember this, never married. Uh, she was known as the virgin queen. And why did she do this? Because even though she had um, supreme power, if she were married, her husband would then um, supersede her or take her, would then have more power than she. So see, this is evidence. Elizabeth never married. She was known as the Virgin Queen. That's evidence. Where am I getting that? That's from our own knowledge of history, okay, of the time period. And then um, I'm connecting it to the argument. And so um, here, uh, this would count as one of the OEs, one of your outside evidences. And you can use two of them. Um, the other thing you have to do twice is a POV cap statement. Pick how the POV, historic context, intended audience, or purpose affects its reliability. And so, um, let's see. Uh, let's do... Um, I want to do this one for an, an image. So we're going to do a, a POV cap statement for this. And so Marcus Gerhardt the Younger, who's the person who created this piece of artwork, always look to see the source. Uh, the English court painter. Um, what is his POV? When you think of POV, think about his job, how he makes money, and um, and how that might affect uh, his ability or her ability to tell the truth. And so in this case, this person's job is the English court painter. He's, uh, he's paid to make portraits of the queen of England. And so do you think he has a, um, a bias based on how he's paid? Do you think he's going to paint her as she appears? Apparently, she had a pockmarked face from smallpox. Also, apparently, she had blackened teeth from um, enjoying too much of that new cash crop sugar that was coming back. But do you see that in the way she's a, of her appearance? No, you definitely don't. Because why? Um, this person, his job is dependent on working for the um, for this patron, for Elizabeth I. And he does not want to... Um, make her unhappy. His job is to make his client or his patron happy. And so um, based on a POV cap statement, we could say, so why this is not a reliable source that this is what she actually looked like is because the painter is being paid um, to 
uh, by her, the patron, to make her appear more powerful. All right. Um, you could also use this as what is the purpose? If you wanted to, instead of do a POV statement, you could do a purpose statement. The purpose of this is um, is is propaganda. It's uh, it's information that is uh, where is this being? Um, this is being shown. Uh, well, here it's at the National Portrait Gallery in London. Uh, but at the time, this would be seen by people uh, either afterwards or during her time period. Uh, and it would be meant to um, to glorify the queen. And so that could be a purpose of it that would make her seem larger than life. So these are ways in which either by POV of the job of the artist or the purpose of it to create this uh, propaganda, this larger than life image, um, where you can argue that this is not a reliable piece of information because um, of these... Um, uh, beca because of the POV of the... The art uh, of the artist okay sorry i'm being a little long-winded here i think that is i think that's it for what i ask so all right that's it so we went over a historic context a thesis um just des describing a document and introducing a document we went over tying it to your argument and we also went over um the uh using outside evidence and also one of the POV cap statements. Okay, I hope this helps. And again, if you have any questions about any of this, parts that are confusing um, or where I didn't explain myself well, please ask uh, and write your questions um, to me either in email or in commenting. All right, thank you so much. Bye.